Um, and yeah, I'd like I'd love to open it up for questions. Um, uh, maybe I'll start off with um, just kind of a general qu general question of like, what was the reception when when you launched your space um, within your communities? Uh, did you have a lot of uh, early adoption, a lot of excitement early on, or was it a, a little bit more um, skeptical or icy or what was that like? Ali, I have a sorted answer to this question, so I don't know if you want to go first. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I don't mind going first for this one. Uh, ours, you know, ours was doing a lot of education. People didn't know what a makerspace was. So I feel like we really um, had to kind of step back and go and explain to people what the concept was. And then our platform is really different. So it, we're not like a typical makerspace where we're only open to adults. We, you know, we do a lot of educational programming, which quite honestly has been our um, our bread and butter. It's kept the doors open. It allows us to uh, keep our prices lower for the adults in our community to afford some of our programming as well. So it, it it's nice when there's, there's uh, funding that comes down from ODE or through the STEM hubs or where we can kind of stretch the stretch the money out all year round is what we do. Um, uh, but so we did a lot of education right at the beginning. And for us originally, because we, we I sat on a committee to get a makerspace written into our 20 year comprehensive plan for our economic element for the city of talent. I sat on a committee so that that would be written into it. So we, we kind of went the back route and did a little groundwork politically to make sure that it was a part of the community um, and written into. So and now that we're building a building, I get to go back and be like, hey, remember the city said they'd support this somehow. So we might be getting a discount on some of our fees and that kind of stuff. But it, it did a, doing a little background was uh, was really important to make sure people knew what we were doing. And then then it got ugly because politics always have to get ugly at some point. Right. Who, who would you think would be against a community makerspace? That was like my biggest like, what? How could people not love this idea? <laughs> But because we were in that economic element plan, there was a group that thought we were like trying to get some land for free, which I don't even know how, like somebody misquoted something in the paper is what it happened. And it took like, instead of being able to like go forward doing the work, we were like, you know, dealing with the press and like what's happening and then trying to really honestly start redoing our, our outreach all over again and explaining what it was. So we had a stumble start too. I don't know if that was your fumbling start, Sarah, but uh, that that's what ours was. I was like super excitement and then some misquote in the newspaper and then like, what? That's that's not right. And then you're, you know, you're trying to correct some misinformation, um, which we all know how fun that is right now, right? <laughs> and this was in 2016, so uh, it wasn't even that bad. Um, but yeah, a lot of, lot of education and educating people on what a makerspace is. Good uh, question. I see your hand, Steve. I just want to piggyback on Allie really quick. I think all um, the education around what a maker space or what a maker lab is and does, I think is, I'll just name for those of you at LBCC, is an ongoing project. <laughs> partly because you have new students who are coming in and partly because I think um, you'll get kind of willing, eager and ambitious faculty who want to do work in there. You'll probably also have willing, eager, and ambitious community partners, but like those players are, are not always consistent over time. And I think what a makerspace or lab can do, if you build it right, it will meet the need you have at the time. So it in of itself will morph in, in its capacity, in its vision, in its focus, depending on who's in it, I think. Um, I will say that hasn't always happened at PCC, but I can see the potential when it's set up correctly. It's an amazing sort of um, amorphous space that can become what you need it to become in the moment. Um, some of our spaces, the sorted history I was referring to is that, you know, depending on which departments you talk to on a campus, in particular the automotive department, they're not super fans of the makerspace because they lost a space in order for that space to be gained. But the engineering department felt like their instructional lab space, you know, like quintupled for them. They were all for it 
the manufacturing loved it. It was right behind the fire doors for them. So they, you know, offloaded some equipment that they didn't really want to use anymore, but they wanted to not give away um, into our space. And so, and we were able to really devise, especially at Sylvania, some summer camps that really crisscrossed engineering and manufacturing, which was kind of cool for middle school kids. Um, but yeah, I think that education piece, you know, folks in other parts of the college haven't always known like, oh, we thought that was a sciencey thing or we thought, you know, like you had to be good at math to go there. And I'm like, no, 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 everybody's here. So it was just infinitely recreating a kind of educational plan to reorient people to like the possibility of the space and what you might be able to think you could do in it. Um, and I had a wonderful, wonderful coordinator. I've had many wonderful wonderful coordinators of the spaces who over the years have really done incredible outreach to just sort of departments that you would think as outliers in a maker community, like the writing department um, and how you might be able to build and publish a book of poems, right? Um, in a maker lab space. Um, we did in the music department, we did a kind of build your own guitar and learned how to play it at the same time, um, capitalizing on the wood shop that we have in another department, but using some of the components um, for sound. And especially when folks want to do electric guitar, some of the, the microelectronic and electronic components there, that kind of thing, um, you know, just, trying to like make graphic design 3D to try and make, you know, the design elements in engineering, like, you know, engineers are terrific at designing things that you actually can't build, which is what the manufacturers are always saying. And so like trying to bring all these worlds together um, and, um, you know, introduce people to the space consistently. And so one of the things that we did do is we created it as a tutoring space and that's been long. So to just pull anybody, students especially, um, in as a space that you can come and just get tutoring for whatever subject area that folks want to tutor in. Um, but then like, hey, what does this 3D printer do? Or, hey, what is what does this big metal thing that cuts metal do? Like, what can you do with that? You know, that kind of thing. And just kind of jumpstart people's curiosity um, and questions. And so at, at PCC, for me, treating it like a retention center, treating it like um, an identity-based retention center, similar to like a women's resource center, or a multicultural center, like treating it as a space where community happens, where support happens, where tutoring can happen. Um, that to me was key for sort of like keeping it going and also like bringing new people in all the time for that education piece. Oops, excuse me. So, and I know Steve had a question, but I'll, I'll throw it back to Forrest. Yeah, Steve, I was just gonna call, uh, throw it over to you. So I have so many questions, I don't know where to start. Where, um, so I understand that every, every facility is gonna be unique, every startup's gonna be unique. Do you have any, big faux pas that you would say we would never do that again if we had it to do over. So what are some of the, the landmines, so to speak, that we need to watch out for? So my two big faux pas first, um, because the space will change over time and because we can't predict what technology will need and want, if you have a chance to build it from the ground up, put way more conduit in the walls and access to it than you think you're ever going to need. Like your contractors are going to be like, you're not going to need that much. Tell them to double it because you don't know what kind of electricity 241 to you don't know what you're going to want to plug in and use. And that stuff is insanely expensive after the fact. Um, the big space at Sylvania, sadly, while we inherited this great, like massive square footage of space, it's in the basement of a building that's entirely cinder blocked. <laughs> so we're very hamstrung to put in bigger pieces of equipment and do bigger things in there because this construction cost to get into the walls to blow out the conduit is it's an insane amount of money. And so we just, we can't do it. So think about the infrastructure behind the things you can't see and go bigger than you think you need to now because what's coming is like unpredictable. Um, the other piece is organization. So depending on kind of the flavor and scope of your space, um, these spaces can easily turn into like 
a tinkering person's paradise and you may have all these little bits and parts and like you're going to need an organization system and you're going to need somebody, maybe several to help you keep it all organized and to do a clean it because it if you don't stay on top of that, it will definitely get away from you. <laughs> and then your space will become something that could be wildly interesting and entertaining, but I don't think will be as inviting um, for both new projects and new people who don't have some orientation to the bits, the parts, the equipment, this, you know, that kind of thing. So that would be my two cents. Thank you. Every, every house has a junk drawer. So you don't want yours to become that junk drawer. <laughs> How about you, Ellie? I love those, Sarah. That's great. Yeah, the the electrical, we're right in the midst of that. So if we have a meeting tomorrow. I'm just going to remind them because we said that at the beginning, but I want to make sure. Um, and we probably don't still don't have enough uh, of that. So thanks for that reminder. Um, and the organization, I would agree with that. Um, I think probably the the one of the biggest things that I constantly this and this is probably has to do with my personality. Um, I constantly go through this every week because nothing is permanent. Like as soon as we get a new piece of equipment, it sort of has a ripple effect where everything moves in the whole space. Like suddenly, you know, the, the 3D printers are not there anymore. They've had to move to a different wall because of something new that we're getting. And I just uh, wish I had earlier accepted. <laughs> it's probably like a, a, some like some message in there spiritually for me of like the impermanence of where things go because I think I we'd build like a whole system and have it be like that's where that's gonna live and I'd be like ah check it off the list and then like three months later we're moving it again so just recognizing that the, the space is always going to shift and move um and then for us um and maybe ours is a little different because we're not on a college campus is uh, we have a designated space for uh, consumables. So they don't just get used up by everybody. And it's behind a cage. Those of you that visited, we, we call it the cage. It looks like we might trap somebody in there someday is what it looks like. But it's got all of our like screws, um, nails for the nail gun, uh, extra glue so that it's just not all out on the floor and everybody can just, you know, have at it. Uh, we're happy to like loan a screw or, you know, Help. usually we tell people if they're um, adults in our workshops, they need to bring their, their own supplies for that kind of stuff. But we do have uh, quite a set of stuff that's been um, donated from, you know, organizations or, or individuals. So we have some of that on hand, but some sort of security for consumables. Um, and this is something we're not gonna be able to do in our, our new space, but it, uh, it definitely was part of our original business plan. And it was having, um, space available. So as people are working on bigger projects, they don't want to like pack it all up at the end of the day and haul it home. And so having um, a system where people can uh, rent a, a cubicle, uh, OpenWorks in Baltimore has a really cool system for that. If you've checked out their website where it's just like plywood cubicles and people can rent that space. And it's, I wish we had the new space in the new building to be able to do that. But I, you know, See, I still have that. That's still my my one that I want to I want to change and do differently. I imagine there's always going to be that kind of stuff, but that might be something to to think about if you have a lot of space. And, and you had mentioned you did some big projects. Uh, have you had any pushback from community, especially other uh, company owners that might uh, are you competing with other um, community efforts to make a living? Has that been an issue? Not, not for us. Um, people in general are pretty psyched. Yeah, we just converted a school bus to housing uh, with students and um, for a family for after the fire. And we did that with a lot of community partnership. Most of the folks we might be competing with are, are folks in the trades. And they're just excited that we are exciting youth about possibly going into those careers because there's such a need. So we haven't, we haven't run into that yet. Okay, good. good. I echo exactly what Ali said. No no issue around competition. I think um, one of the things over the years that's been so impressive is that I feel like the maker community is so good at figuring out where there's a gap and trying to fill it. Um, and so when Allie talked about like creating PPE for the pandemic when it first hit and things like that, like it, it's really more about the collaboration and the community building than anything else. Um, and igniting folks around some of the trades and just even 
being able to work with your hands, being able to like design and dream and make things, I think has been incredible. So let us know when you get anybody that makes it to Shark Tank. I can keep going if other people don't have questions. I, one of my interests will be how do you sustain it with materials? Obviously, Ali, some of your bigger projects and Sarah probably has some too, but um, are, are there places, government agencies, especially if you're doing FEMA, something for FEMA trailers and things like that, but how do you, uh, you addressed how you do consumables and that's a great idea to keep in mind because those things can all of a sudden get away from you. But what about, um, materials for? Yeah, uh, we've really leveraged our community partnerships and uh, Timber Products is one of our biggest sponsors and they're, they're right down the street from you, I think, <laughs> or in your neighborhood. Um, they have donated thousands and thousands of dollars worth of, of plywood to us and it's how we built out the space. All of our workbenches are made out of it. Our sewing tables are made out of it. It's really they're high grade finished plywood. Um, we used it in the bus project. So those kind of materials, uh, when we can get them donated are awesome. We've reached out to like Rotha Bloss has supplied uh, fasteners for us. And so we have a shop full of uh, extra, extra screws that help us offset costs throughout the year whenever we do programming. So when we, you know, write a grant, um, we've gotten mattresses donated for the beds we make, uh, local uh, flooring companies have donated uh, cutoffs that we've glued up, like we'll just have interns glue them up and remake them into something else. So we've made like the footings for our beds out of a bunch of glued up hardwood that's scraps from a flooring company. So it's, you gotta be a little scrappy and and um, it's not like throwing elbows, uh, but it's it's definitely you got to be scrappy and willing to ask, which I was not willing to do at the beginning. I was all about like, we're all, we're great all by ourselves. We can do this. And then it's like, we don't, we, of course we do. We can make it. It's sort of you're, you're doing this uh, dance between selling yourself as being like self-sustaining and also really acknowledging how much you need the rest of the community to make it make it work. So there's a, there's a, certainly a balance there. Well, as a former CTE high school teacher, uh, bartering uh, and asking, I'm familiar with that. So uh, it can be a win-win. You might have something they want and they have something you need. So uh, we'll keep that in mind. Yeah, we'll I would start also- Start a barter squad. Steve, from a college perspective, I think that barter like from within. So, you know, scrap metal, scrap wood that's left over from the machine shop or that kind of thing, or even just in our college community, I'm always sort of impressed with what folks can sort of recycle, upcycle, you know, and make into something else. Um, so that's been hugely um, advantageous for us. The other piece that I'll just say is build it into your general fund. You're going to need materials. Make sure there's something in there that allows you to buy things that you're never going to get back and that you can't somehow repurpose. So like your 3d printers are going to need filament, um, all the time. <laughs> and there's, you know, you can't stock that stuff infinitely because it goes bad over time. So you, ha it has a window of life, right? Like within about a year or two. Um, so, you know, I would, as you think about how to build out a fund, making sure that in your materials and supplies, you've got, some budget in there um, that's going to be worthwhile and comparable to the space. And if there was another thing I could add to my like one to two things to know before, like put a little more in there than you think you need, because everything's just going to get more expensive. <laughs> and Katie, I see your question in the chat. I'm working on it. Do you have flat fees that you charge participants or is it a negotiable is it how, how's that work or do you charge at all um i for us um we pre-covid had a membership model um and it was 45 dollars a month we wanted it to be really affordable 
there's a maker space two towns over that charges $140 a month. So but they also have 20,000 a square feet that they're trying to heat and <laughs> provide, you know, their, their electrical bills are probably what our rent is every month. So, you know, we're, we're, it's just how big you scale and, and everything else increases all those costs. So um, we had a membership model, but I loved how, um, how Sarah mentioned the amorphous space and it's constantly changing and adjusting to the time. So we closed down during COVID and now we've got people knocking on the door again saying, well, how, can, how do we get back in? What do we do? How, how can we sign up? Um, people are chomping at the bit and we're not ready. Like we've got our educational programming going through the summer and then we're like, wait a second, the membership model didn't, it didn't quite work. Um, and honestly, I really struggle with the word membership. It sounds like this elitist society um, and doesn't really fit what, what we're trying to, how we're trying to portray ourselves in the community. And so we're trying to come up with like, everyone's a member, but how do we charge for that? And, and what does that look like? And so coming up with a, a different term that works, that's maybe a little bit more equity-based um, and, uh, and can still meet the needs of allowing the, the general community in there. Um, for us, we had like checkoffs for each tool and equipment. And once somebody got checked off on that, they could come in and use it. Um, and we, we charged for that. You know, we have really amazing, awesome insurance <laughs> and happy to share that with whoever wants to get in touch with that. So, cause you need an insurance company. I, you're probably all insured through the school. So it maybe it isn't as big a deal for you, but, um, that we had to find an insurance company that was familiar with what makerspaces did. And I still don't know that they do. I, I can't imagine sometimes <laughs> the things they're insuring with us, but we pay a lot for it and, and it's helped cover that. So liability. So we have waivers for just about everything. We have no charges for anything, <laughs> which I should say that students pay tuition that includes an activities fee. So there is a charge somewhere, but it isn't, uh, it doesn't feel direct, nor is it directly applied to us. I have a question. How did you, whenever you guys were first starting your maker spaces, how did you get people involved in wanting to come to the maker space um, and kind of like, I think you, Sarah, you might've mentioned it earlier, maybe Allie as well, um, how you had to tell this was a maker space for everybody, but um, what were some things that you guys did to get the community involved? We did study breaks at the end of the year um, where we just like, we had like a smoothie maker that was powered to a bike. So you could come like pedal yourself to a smoothie. Um, as I mentioned before, we also leverage the space enormously um, from a student-centered perspective to just drive traffic and do tutoring there, do advising there, like just do some regular student service -y things in the space. Um, and then we started hosting community education courses like jewelry making because we could utilize some of the tools and equipment in there for that. Um, and then hosting different orgs at the college like um, there's the um, AAWCC, which I, it's the Women in Community Colleges Association, like their meetings would be like, just hold your meeting here, or you want to have a department meeting, you can have it here and that kind of thing. So just sort of really trying to invite people to the space as a place that they could just use, not necessarily to come in and make anything, but to just be in the space. Um, and we've hosted program reviews and those kinds of things. So just to sort of create some college activity, community activity in the space, irrespective was one strategy we had. Um, that's awesome. We did the we we did very similar things and and a ton of networking. I went to way too many meetings and uh, so making sure that we were well represented um, at like business and education partnerships and the Rogue Advanced Manufacturing Partnership and making sure just constantly reminding people we were there. Um, we had a, a huge fundraiser right at the beginning that was a, a maker market. Um, in the space. So we had, we offered no, no vendor fee. So they could, they could come and set up and then they donated one item to us that was worth $50 or more. And then we had a silent auction afterwards. It was just a great, huge fundraiser for everything, but it got people in the space and it made us, I think our, that first time we did it, it made $15,000 because we had the market during the day. And then we had this kind of upscale auction at night with all these really cool, 
local artisan made very nice things as well as other things that got donated. But then, then suddenly people knew who we were, you know, we were out asking for donations for those. And, and so uh, that huge fundraiser right at the beginning really, really um, kicked us off and got people excited about getting into the space because they had either contributed in some way or been to the market. So. Um, I've got a, a couple quick questions or, or maybe they're, they're quick, maybe they're not. Um, one would be, uh, how, how have you managed to com convince or talk to people about, um, investing in the spaces in kind of a time of, you know, budget cuts and, and scaling back, um, uh, I assume that you've probably both been through that and in, in at least some kind of capacity. Oh, Allie, I think you're on mute. I was just saying, if you want to go first, that's oh. great. <laughs> um, I, so yes. And I think to the first part of your question for us, like, honestly, it, it's like one-to-one -one conversation. I mean, our, as big as Portland Community College is, it's still like, not that big. Um, and the people in their positions doing the work with students matter deeply and like just making a meeting and having coffee and sort of leveraging the relationship or trying to build a relationship so that they had a connection to the space um, was something that our coordinators and myself frequently um, do. And so, um, I think to have the space itself is by definition, you know, something that I've been able to leverage over time with colleagues. So like when they have either lost space and needed a space, when they have, um, because of budget cuts or when they have just needed to do something differently, less expensively, et cetera, we've been able to be that for them. So a good example too is, over the years, we started making the awards, um, like the actual physical awards that were given at various events for the college. And so um, we just kind of built that in and we can make them as part of a student project in a class. We can also just construct them for folks who want to come and use the equipment and then they make little bits of it and then somebody assembles it down the road. Um, and so, and we've done that as a way of just kind of trying to build investment and for folks to sort of open their imagination about what's possible. Um, I will say to the budget cut piece directly, you know, while I'm saying like build the space bigger than you need, put money in places more than you think you need. Obviously we all have to at the community colleges and even in the nonprofit world, like be pretty frugal and creative and scrappy with the funds that we've were given. Um, and I think that's one of the beautiful, like the beautiful things about maker lab spaces is like the inherent tenor of the community is that scrappiness. And so folks are really able to do a lot with very little and it's, I've been immensely impressed over the years, um, which is not an invitation to not fund them or to underfund them, but um, is also like, imagine what you could, you know, imagine what we could do if we had a little more money, you know, like we can be this creative with this little, you know, so I think it's knowing that the space itself, it can survive some of the weathers of budgetary ups and downs if you can get really creative about how to use it. Um, and how to leverage it in your communities. I don't know, Ali, you may have way more interesting. <laughs> no, I would just, I, that, that is, uh, well, I would just add to it is all I would do. Uh, yes to everything you said. And then the other piece that I would add is it's, um, I would almost argue it's irresponsible to not fund us. Like the, the, the essential um, service that we provide the community or provide at the college level. Um, RCC here uh, is, you know, is working on expanding their advanced manufacturing. And I, I just feel like it, it, it's going to shift somehow where people will see the, the necessity of having it. And so it maybe wouldn't be the first thing that that's cut because it's seen as frivolous. Um, it's, 
it's really essential. Um, and I think the last couple of years have really shown that um, just at a, at a very community level um, for us down here anyway. I, I think everybody was like, how did we survive without you? Was sort of what, what has happened here, uh, which is great. So once you can kind of get that little establishment, I think it um, really helps. And that's really great. And one of the things that I'm, I'm also, I think kind of ties into that um, is uh, being that resource, especially in underserved communities, um, thinking about diversity and equity and inclusion. How have, have you guys been able to, or how have you seen your spaces being able to serve um, those needs in your communities? <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll hop in on this one. Um, uh, that has been um, maybe one of the most meaningful uh, parts of our work is, uh, well, for me anyway, is just the idea of sort of shifting that paradigm that's always existed uh, and providing opportunities for folks who maybe wouldn't have it before. So that, that part is, is what excites me about the work we're doing. Um, we are going to great lengths to not just have our like Black Lives Matter sign on the front door and we have like an all our welcome mosaic sign right above when you walk in. Like it's one thing to say those things and have those signs up, but if you're not creating a space where everybody feels like they belong, it, they're just words. And so we are really kind of looking at what are we actually doing that creates that sense of belonging. And there's an incredible book about it that we've been all reading. And, and we are we actually doing surveys of folks who come into the space and our students that are doing our programming on how much they actually feel like they belong. Do they feel validated? Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to like grab it real quick quick. It's a it's creating a culture of belonging with dignity. Those are all the words in the title, but I might've just word saladed them all up. I'm horrible on the spot. Uh, John Crabapple is one of the authors, so with a K. And I can't remember the other author. So see, here I go throwing down a resource and I can't even provide it. Um, <laughs> I'll look it up real quick. When Sarah answers this question, I'll get that for you. <laughs> but it, it's a great book and it's driving a lot of the work we're doing to make sure we're, um, we're actually wa uh, walking the talk. <laughs> um, I'll piggyback um, and say that piece that Ali mentioned about belonging is very big and someone else in the room reminded me that I had said something about this in an earlier conversation so thank you um, but yeah I think for me it's been about um, making sure that everyone who comes into the space feels like they belong there and even more than that um, that they were expect they, they, they knew that we were expecting them to show up. So we didn't have to scramble to figure out how to make something accessible, or we didn't have to scramble to like make something right for them in some way, but that it was already there and waiting, right? And that that piece around belonging is really like, oh, you were expecting me. Like you clearly were prepared for me, whatever me is to show up, right? Um, and I think alongside that, like creating those spaces where they're inclusive of gender, inclusive of race, ethnicity, class, language, accessibility, um, those kinds of things. Um, but also like, how do we also move the needle around some of the things where we know, you know, communities of color, um, impoverished communities, you know, possibly second language speakers, you know, don't, feel like they have access because of historical and systemic um, things that they've experienced either in schools coming up through K-12, in their communities, right? And their access to both for me on a college campus, but also for me in a space that has history and tie to things like the sciences and math and engineering, how do we build a bridge Right. And I feel really strongly that Maker Lab and Maker Spaces are those bridges. Right. And if done well um, and done very from the get go, a lot of intentionality around belonging, it does create that bridge. 
right, to sort of historically and systemically marginalized communities around STEM fields, around college campuses. Um, and I think that they just become this unique place where I think people can feel and find a community for themselves and also uncover even in, within themselves, right? Like, oh, I didn't know I was creative in that way, right? Or that there was this thing that could help me be creative in that way. Um, and so it sort of cultivates the dreamer in all of us a little bit, which I think we need in this time. So I don't know if I directly answered that question very well, but that's those great. Are all the parts that yeah. Um I think we have got time for one more question, and I'll put uh, my uh, contact information in uh, the chat if you'd like to con uh, continue the discussion. Um, I've also been maybe kind of thinking about uh, some some other folks with spaces similar that we may be able to recreate event an event like this again. So, um, but yeah, uh, does do we have anybody that has a, a question ready for our kind of last closing question? If not, then maybe my question would be, uh, I guess, what would you, for people who are, for, you know, looking toward creating a space, what's the, what's the advice that you give regularly that you, and maybe, and I'll give you two questions. <laughs> what do you, what do you, what have you drawn the most from with your spaces? What's given you the most life in your spaces? What's it, what was it? Was it what if you? I was typing my email address and I just made it out. <laughs> no problem. I totally get it. Um, so, uh, what's the advice that you would give to somebody or to people, communities that are looking to create their own space like yours? And then, um, what is the thing that gives you the most life in the work um, that you're doing? That's an awesome question. Um, I mean, just really be willing to do the work. Like that's, that's the thing. I think we, we met with a group in Grants Pass. It was like, well, we can't get it going. I'm like, well, just get it going. Like it was like, there was all this discussion about getting it going. I'm like, you just got to get in there and do it at some point. So that's that's the one thing I was just like, get going on it and and get get people together who are excited about it and and willing to sacrifice a little bit of their time and their energy um, to, to make it happen. So for me, just the, um, the thing that just motivates me all the time with the work is just seeing how it changes people's lives. Uh, it's, it's really made a difference in, um, students. We have students going to OSU that worked on our bus project that weren't even thinking about going to college. And so, and now they're in engineering at OSU. Like those are the kinds of things that are like, what, how is this happening? And so, um, working with students who articulate on their way out that they're having an awesome time and that they're they're stoked about what they're doing and they're like hey i never thought i could do this so um that's that's what motivates me i'll give you my short answer even though that could be a really long one i echo everything ali said she's spot on um i think for me the that piece about watching people realize the things about themselves that they didn't even know existed. Um, for me, it's also been watching my machinists who went into machining for a very specific reason, realize they're actually better designers, um, that they have the skill to make the stuff, but that they really wanna be in the design capacity. And then also watching our engineers realize like, oh, that job sits behind a desk all day and I don't actually get to do or touch anything. Like that is not the job I want, right? Like I think I'd much rather be a machinist <laughs> um, and sort of helping people find, you know, like this space in themselves um, and realize something that they didn't even know was there or didn't know it was there in that capacity. That kind of thing has been really, really rewarding. So um, yeah. That's I have to run, but thank you so much. This has been awesome. Thank you, Forrest. Thank you, Sarah, for your leadership. And, and uh, Sarah Tillery, thank you for your expertise and Ellie. Um, glad to hear things are going well in Southern Oregon. I just sold my place in Grants Pass and I miss Southern Oregon, but uh, I'm loving it up here too. So uh, have a great day and I appreciate it. This won't be the last time we meet. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Thank you, everybody who is here and Allie and Sarah. I can't tell you how much I appreciate you guys.
Um, this is really lovely. Thanks for coordinating for us. Thanks so much. Always fun to tell. Yeah. I will make this recording available for everybody um, and I'll, I'll probably post it to the STEM Hubs uh, YouTube or something like that. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.